Welcome back to the Arabella Boathouse. This week, Steve starts out by installing the finished sink and wood pieces in the head, and then gets the long settee tank situated and well supported. You'll also hear how and why he plans to install a water maker into the boat. Then at the end of the episode, he'll go into detail about the desiccant toilet that he chose and how he plans to have a shower without pressurized water. All of the wood for the head is ready to install. Several days before, Anne took several trips to the varnish room in the house, and after a quick clean with denatured alcohol, put several coats of Danish teak sealer on all the pieces, and then the countertop and the sink got a couple coats of varnish as well. I'm pretty happy with how this came out. Not bad for a first attempt. So the attaching it was really easy. We just got three bolts back here uh, that go through the bulkhead and that locks that in really solidly. And if we want to take this out, it's just popping off three nuts and it'll come out. We've got our access here for the water tank and this one we can spin out of the way. The others 
don't interfere with the tanks. We'll be able to open up this inspection port and get in there. And then this is set up for a foot pump and fresh water. So we're going to mount a foot pump down the bottom here somewhere. And that way you'll have fresh water in the head. Some heads have fresh and salt water, but we're just going to do fresh. And then this one is for soap. So we'll mount a little container under there and hook a hose up to that. And that way when you're in the head, you should be able to mount, do the foot pump with your foot and be able to wash your hands and stay seated if you want, or very easily be able to stand and foot pump and to use the sink. We've got some storage space above and lots of storage space down below. And the drain's gonna come through here at the bottom as will the inlet for the, uh, the water. And we'll hide those in a little nice facade in the corner down there so you don't really notice them. The sink is just glued in with some 5200. I know that that's overkill and I know that that's very permanent, but it's fine. If I'm ever rebuilding this down the road, I'm probably gonna be throwing in a new small sink anyways. So not concerned about that. I'd rather it well attached and nicely sealed which it is. So I've elected to set the boat up with foot pumps and not a pressure system. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, even if you do a pressure system, it's wise to have a foot pump so that if you lose electricity or something goes wrong with your pump, you still have access to the water. Uh, and the real main reasons though are is when you have pressurized water, you use more pressurized water, you use more water. Uh, so if I'm here running a foot pump, you know, it's coming out of this tap a lot slower than if we had it hooked up for pressurized, like in your house. Uh, and then it's very easy to turn the faucet on and let it just run. Where when you have a foot pump, you know, you have a much better idea of what you're actually using it and you're using it at a slower rate. So that way we don't have to make as much water, which requires more energy. Uh, so the more efficient we can be with our use of fresh water, the better. And the foot pumps will go a long way towards that. So one of the things that I've elected to do with Arabella is put in a water maker. Uh, and one of the big reasons for that is that finding potable water uh, in places around the world can be a little bit challenging. Uh, and you got to be careful about what water you put in your tanks because it doesn't take much to introduce some sort of growth or bacteria or cause some sort of issue. So more and more boats now are putting in water makers so that you can take salt water and make fresh water anywhere that you have decently clear salt water. Uh, we still put in 95 gallons of tankage, which with a water maker would seem extreme. But the water makers are mechanical and they are not 100% foolproof. So if we go to do a big crossing, really like to start with full tanks. Uh, and if the water maker dies, have enough tankage on the boat to be able to maybe do water rations, but be able to get to where we need to go without being in trouble. Uh, the other thing is going places where you can't make water. So if we are going to go up a muddy river, if we are going to go into a fjord that is has a glacier that's draining into it and we've got muddy silty dirty water it's really really hard on the water makers so that would be a great instance we would know advance that we were going to be someplace like that and before we got there we can fill all of the tanks on deck and be good with water for a few weeks and then jump back out to some clearer water and make some more water so having that tankage just gives us safety and gives us a lot of flexibility my intent is to put the water maker in here and we've got some facsimiles made up here. These are all definitely oversized because none of these parts are particularly square. So if we can fit all of these boxes in here, we will certainly fit all of the pieces in here because uh, they are actually a bit smaller. So here's our high pressure pump and that will fit something like that. Think we'll be able to tuck that in there and as long as it's up just a little bit we'll be able to get into the inspection part that won't be a problem let's see we've got a C strainer we've got a control panel we've got a pre filter and then there's the membrane so this seems like a kind of a lot but C strainer is not too terribly big and the control panel is not too terribly big. And our pre-filters would mount on a wall bulkhead very, very nicely. 
Uh, so this is kind of what we would end up. And these will get rearranged, obviously, a bit of it. We'll have to play with it. Um, but the water will come. There's a boost pump that will send the water into the sea strainer and through the pre-filters. The sea strainer will catch the real big stuff. Pre-filters will catch the small stuff. Then it gets routed into a high pressure pump, uh, which jacks it up to, I forget, it's like eight or 900 PSI. It's something ridiculous. Uh, and what that does is it forces the salt water through a membrane and only clear fresh water can make it through. Uh, it pulls out most of the viruses, bacteria, minerals. It, it's pretty amazing. So the last piece of the puzzle that we're missing here and that won't fit in the head is the pressure membrane, which is basically just a huge cylinder. And I think that that will might go back here pretty well. They are roughly the diameter of this stovepipe and gives you some idea. And the length would end where this blue tape is. And I think that we can mount this up somewhere behind the workbench very easily. And all it needs is a line going in and a line going out. So we can plumb into it and plumb right back into the head. And then we have entrances to the tanks in the corner here and on the other side of the bulkhead. And we'll have to run one over to the SETI tank. Uh, there's also going to be a valve system that goes in here so that we can control where the water maker is putting the water. So it will come out of those membranes. There's a discharge where the brine goes back overboard and the water that we keep will go into a manifold with some shutoffs and we'll be able to decide whether it goes into tank one, two, or three. Uh, so this gives you an idea of what the water maker system looks like. We're not gonna purchase it for a while. We're not gonna build it in here for a while. We just need to, to have a good idea that everything will fit. Uh, and when we get a lot closer to launch, that'll be a system that we invest in and, and start putting in here. But like everything, we need to plan for it well in advance. Next on the to-do list was to get ready to fit the bilge tanks into place. There will be two tanks going under the sole here, the stainless pickup tank that you've seen previously, fabricated by Evan, who made all the other water tanks, and a polystyrene gray water holding tank. Both of these will be set onto a pad and nestled below the sole beams.
As the pads for the bilge tanks dried up in the house, Steve turned his attention to fitting the settee tank in the saloon. No, you don't wear a hat. <laughs> you put up with so much, you're so good. So this is my old hickory mallet. I churned this on the lathe significantly before I started building Arabella. And it has served me for many projects before Arabella. It's cut the whole rabbit, most of the notches for the frames. You've seen me use it a lot. But as you can see, it's starting to fall apart and splinter, which Hickory does. It's given me more than one splinter now. And David, who's a regular volunteer, took some big locusts home and started dropping off locust mallets that he was making. So I gave him my old hickory mallet and a chunk of live oak and asked him to churn essentially as close to my hickory mallet as he could in live oak and it is almost twice as heavy <laughs> like literally almost twice as heavy so thank you David uh, anybody want my old mallet there's the piece in the middle it's like the V that the tank sits in and I use the line here to pull the tank level and then I measured from the back of the tank down to the frame and I just did it at the forwardmost frame and the aftmost part here on the build stringer and in the aft part here there was a two inch difference between the tank and the build stringer and up forward there was a two and a half inch difference uh, and that was partially due because of the build stringer, partially due because of the shape of the boat. Uh, so then I took a one and a half inch board and put it in there. And so that means on the forward end, I need an extra inch to pad it out to an inch and a half. And in the back, I need an extra half inch. Can install those and then pick up the distances to the rest of the frames and make custom pads for each of those and that'll give me a straight line supported on the frames and that should support the back of the tank. Set this down a bit so it's not. Banging around where it can hurt things. I guess bilge tanks. Bilge tanks. So I gotta cut the bulkhead back. I gotta cut that bulkhead back. I gotta trim the bolts and give them a peen. Uh, and then I need to cut a little bit out of this one so that the tank will fit in there.
these tanks pretty much fit in here. We're gonna have to do something to fasten them down and make sure they don't rattle around. But the bases fit in there nice and snug. We got the deck beams carved out. And this beam landed over the tank, but thankfully the screws land on either side. So it'd be really easy to, to undo the screws and slide this out and still have really good access without taking the, the sole beam out. Should be really handy down the road. And now we know exactly how much real estate we have to work with up here and what our obstacles are for hooking up the gray water tank and tapping into the, the pickup tank for the water. So the gray water tank, we got a bunch of PVC fittings here and figure out exactly what we need and go return some of these and get some different ones. But just got what I needed to kind of start to figure things out. And then these are the caps that are gonna go in here. So those will get screwed in. And these will lead to the other tanks with a shut off valve. And then these ones will go on here and those will be the pickups. And one of these will head over to the galley sink or to the head sink. And this one will head over to the galley sink. And that'll be the pickups out of this tank. Now we can get this glued up and take everything apart, bring it in and start finishing it. Off camera, Steve put a bunch of holes in the bottom of the pad for the pickup tank. It'll give any condensation a place to go and help protect the stainless from corrosion. The upper support for this tank was a little finicky to get situated in there because we couldn't clamp it from without uh, obstructing the tank going in and you can't reach behind there to hold it. Uh, so we used a bit of a tape at one point and some zip ties at another point so that we could get that situated and held in place with the tank in there. And once we got it pinned in place, I was able to drill and put in a, a copper nail at either end, one into a frame and one into the build stringer. And that's all that support really should need. We just need to stop it from sliding down and those two nails will do it. And I'm willing to bet after we fill this wool otter and go beat around a little bit, it's gonna settle in there even some more. And uh, I don't think it's gonna go anywhere. So this is where this tank lives for now. Uh, and we're gonna leave the strap there for now so that we can get it out uh, I am struggling a little bit with how permanently to connect and install everything. It would really be nice to just connect all these tanks and call it a day, but at the same time, we still have a deck to put on and more work to do, and I know there's sawdust and things that are going to fall behind there. Uh, so we're trying to walk the line between getting things put together enough and having things be able to be taken apart enough that we can kind of do the final clean and varnish and stuff inside the boat and then put things in permanently. Um, yeah, so I think this is about as far as this is gonna go. We're gonna have all sorts of little details to wrap up at the very end. It's supposed to be 50 degrees tomorrow. And it will be. Because this is New England in March. <laughs> and now, as mentioned at the top of the show, here's a bit more detail from Steve about his reasoning for the desiccant head and his plans for taking showers while aboard. Things are coming together here in the head. Uh, we've got our head mounted in the grate. And right now, this isn't the full final install. Uh, we've got to seal the shower pan that we made uh, down at Narwhal Labs a while back with Total Boat. And that's got to get attached and sealed really well to these bulkheads so that when you're in here with wet foul gear and you hang it up to dry, or more likely when you're in here to take a shower, and that water runs down these bulkhead walls that it doesn't escape. Uh, so we're going to wait until much closer to launch and we can take this pan out, give everything behind there a good clean and bed it and fasten it for real. Uh, but in the interim, you can just kind of chill out here. So we got our grate, and if you want to take the grate out, a 
This one just lifts out. And that'll let you get down to the drain down here to clean that out. And then when this one's out, you'll be able to take this out. And the head is attached to the base here, which is attached to the grate. And these pieces are the ones that were eventually going to bed really well down against the pan and against the bulkhead and fasten those in and those will be the waterproof and we'll paint those and seal that all up once those once that time comes and we're ready to install it uh, like I said for now it can can all just kind of hang out and these grates are eventually going to have to get fastened so that they can't shift around because uh, right now if you were to tip the toilet you know the grate would go with it and I'm not 100% sure at this point how I'm going to do that but it's a problem for future Steve. Lots of easy ways to solve it. So I'm not worried about it at all. And following our friend uh, Courtney and Pete's advice, we made a little pad so that you can put the head in there. And slide the pad underneath. There's some brackets that go here that we may use, we may not use. We might create a strap that goes around it. I'm not quite sure. I'm not totally loving how the pee jug comes in and out of there. But so far, that is my only and very minor complaint. So, so far, well done, Airhead. Cool, that's gonna work, we got enough room here. Usually do it over the rail, but if you wanted some privacy, make sure that works. Uh, so I chose an Airhead here, uh, and there's a couple features for that that we liked. Uh, one was that it has a gasket here around the lid and around the seat. And the nice thing for that is that when you sit on it, you compress those gaskets and you can take a shower in the head and not have the water get into the head, which causes a problem for this type. So that's a really nice feature. Um, and this is called a composting head, but I put compost in quotes because it's not really a composting head. What this really is is a desiccant head. Uh, and dealing with poop, is just unpleasant on boats. There's no good way about it. Uh, and you know, you can direct deposit overboard, but what do you do when people are around? You know, that's kind of embarrassing. It's frowned on in populated marinas. Uh, and the options then are, are a holding, holding tank, a bucket, or uh, a composting toilet, a desiccant head. Uh, and this is basically just like a really glorified bucket. Uh, and how this works is there's a lever here and it opens or closes a compartment. So if you are equipped with a central hose attached to your body and you want to come and use this bathroom to go number one, you can leave this like this and if you urinate on here, it gets directed through a gap and it goes into the pee jug. And how this head really works is it's separating the liquids from the solids. And if you are to sit, then it ends up going in these forward drains. But no matter how you use it, the idea is the urine goes into the jug that you take out and dispose of. And you open this lever, it opens that trap door, and that's where you want to put your solid waste is in the bucket. And inside the bucket, I can open this up. Is this crank and this handle. And in here, you put some sort of desiccant medium. They recommend coca, coca fiber bricks. You put some enzymes in here as well. But the real, the real money maker of this system is the vent. So, when that's in there, there's a hole in the side down here. There's one on this other side, and that goes right through the container that holds your fecal matter. That gets connected to this hose. So that'll go in here, and that'll go up to the house top where we'll put a small dorate box. This hose gets attached to this plastic Jim Jam, and in the plastic Jim Jam goes a small 12 volt fan. Uh, and some people set these up with their own little solar power so that they're not drawing off of your house bank. You can wire them up to the house bank, however you want to set it up. But the idea really is that this is a desiccant system. You put the waste in, 
you mix it with the coca fiber, you stir it all up with some enzymes and it dries it all out and that reduces the odor, uh, reduces the volume. And then when this starts to get full, you can dispose of it properly. If you're offshore, you can just dump it. Um, there's a ton of literature about where you can and can't dispose of the waste. So it's a little nicer than a bucket, does a bit better job, uh, but that's, that's essentially all that it is. And the other real option for this is to put in a more classic style head with what you call a black water tank. So you'd go to the bathroom like you do in your house, You'd use water to flush it like you do in your house, and you would have a tank somewhere in your boat that is filled with liquid poo like you have in a septic tank that's just sloshing around in there. And uh, you can pump it overboard if you're someplace you can do that, or you can get it pumped out at the marina exactly like you would use an RV where you go up to the pump station and they hook it up and pump it out. Uh, but you know, tanks rupture, hoses leak, things happen, and you end up with liquid black water floating around your boat if you're not really, really careful. Uh, so some people really like the desiccant style composting head. Some people really like the traditional black water head. Uh, it's, a, it's really a personal decision, and, and no matter what way you do it, you're, you're dealing with human poo, and it's just not fun. <laughs> Water the boathouse. Yeah. <laughs> we set up the pan in here to be waterproof so that we could have a shower in the head. Uh, but we're not gonna have pressurized water and we're not gonna have hot water. So how are we going to have a shower? Uh, and the answer to that is we're gonna launch and try and see how we like it. This rig or something similar to it. There's a lot of different variations of this, but this is a pressurized shower made for camping. Uh, and it's really simple. Robin and I used it when we went camping in Maine last summer. This is actually Robin's, uh, and I was really impressed with it. So it stands up on its own, which is really nice. It's got a big lid here, so you can open it up and you can pour water into it. As you can see, it stands up on its own. Top here is clear, so you can look in and see how much water is remaining. They make it in a couple different sizes. And it's just got a, just a foot pump here. So you put the foot pump on the ground. And you can see this thing is coming up to pressure. And it's nice, once you pump it up, you can run for a little while before you need to pump it. And with the foot pump, it actually works really well because it's hands-free. Uh, you can lock this nozzle off and, and you know hang it up so it's running just like a normal shower. And as you're going along, you're just pumping that foot. Uh, you can take it up on deck, which is really nice. We can take it on shore for adventures. They're not terribly expensive. They're easily replaced. And we got a few more things to go on in the head here, but eventually I'd like to find a spot where this can get tucked or hang. We can add a longer hose where the foot pump goes, find a good way to anchor the foot pump down to the sole. And you'll be able to take this, fill it up with water, hang it on the deck, let it get nice and hot, take a shower. If it's too cold, boil up some water, heat up some water, pour it in there. Uh, and this should be a pretty, pretty easy system. Adding hot water and pressurized water, it just takes so much energy and space out of the boat. Um, so if we were gonna put in a, a more conventional shower, we would need a pressurized pump so that the water comes out of the tanks and gets pressurized. Ideally, it would go into an accumulator tank so that that pump wasn't running all the time. Uh, and then that would have to go to a hot water heater uh, so that we could have hot water on demand. And all of this takes up space and cost and complications. So in cruising, there's the folks who say, you know, like the par days, Go very simple, go now, small boat. And then talking with folks like Sailing Totem who've been cruising for a long time, you know, their recommendation is don't make it a camping trip, make it comfortable. So we're trying to kind of strike that balance between being able to come down below and take a hot shower in cold weather, but not having all of these complicated, more complicated systems that take up room and expense and energy and all of that. And if we launch with this and we try it for a while and I hate it and I really want hot water at the tap, then We'll add all that stuff later and figure out where to put it. I'm not scared of making alterations.
In the background today, you might have seen and heard KP banging away on something. And on next week's episode, you'll see them working on the last of the deck beams over the anchor locker and the blocking for the stem and stern. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe and comment with what you thought of the video today. And we'll see you again next Friday.